In this episode of Unwind Your Mind Back to God, written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh, we continue laying the foundation with Book 1, Chapter 5, Section 11. Questions and Answers on the Holy Spirit Friend, is there a specific technique you teach people on how to hear the Holy Spirit? David It is not so much a specific technique in the sense that the Holy Spirit's curriculum is highly individualized. There are so many different meditation techniques, tools, paths, etc., when I am asked, give me something specific that I can do to hear the Holy Spirit, or how can I hear the Holy Spirit's voice? The short answer is to point to ACIM, just because it is the path that I used and it was successful. I also studied many other paths and was well-read and very open-minded about many teachers and techniques. But in the end, it was ACIM that came to me. It was dropped in my lap. It was in English instead of Aramic or Latin. It did not have to be retranslated. It was in a language that involved psychology, religion, and Christianity. Since I spent 10 years studying in college and graduate school, I was well versed in education. Terms like curriculum and learning goal were very familiar. It is perfectly delivered for me. It is a how-to book with a text, workbook, and manual for teachers. I have absolutely no excuses. So when people ask me specifically, I point them to the text of ACIM, where Jesus says, Study this text. He told Helen and Bill, I'm giving it to you, but you must study the notes. For me it was the same. Study the text and then do the workbook lessons. The workbook is very explicit and has specific instructions. It has daily instructions on what to do, how to do it, and how long to do it. It also has the teacher's manual for when you get to the point of really starting to hear the Holy Spirit's voice. There are helpful pointers there as you begin to fine-tune your learning and listening instrument. That is my short answer as to how I hear the Holy Spirit's voice. I just point to the course. The course is not for everyone. But for those that feel the course is their path, whatever language they are reading it in, I just say, hang in there with that text workbook and manual for teachers. Friend, A Course in Miracles says that only a few can hear the Holy Spirit or God's voice. What is your take on that statement? David, Within the realm of time and space, where we seem to have a cosmos of billions of people, creatures and beings, Countless other galaxies 
and solar systems. Within that larger context, the relative context, I would say that there are very few that hear God's voice. The distortions of the ego seem to be layers and layers of overlays that prevent a perfectly clear expression of the Holy Spirit through individuals. I will use the example of Helen Schuckman, who took down A Course in Miracles. The dictation process took about seven years. It was not the dictation itself or the receiving that was difficult, but the ego resistance to hearing this message was enormous. So we have Helen, who is a good symbol of very high scribal ability. Yet, it was still a seven-year process that could have possibly taken a year or a year and a half without enormous resistance. Frequently with this process, the words were given and written down with shorthand dictation. And even then, there were distortions with what was received. In which case, she was guided to make changes. This shows that even for someone who had such a high scribal ability that she could hear the voice of Jesus Christ coming through, there were still ego distortions and ego interferences. They were really based on the fear of love, which is what the whole ego realm is about. It took a very careful going back and going through it with Jesus to come up with what we call the Your Text, which was then edited and came to be the Hugh Lynn Case version. It was further edited to what is now the published version of A Course in Miracles. You can see that this is a seeming process in terms of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit and that it is fairly accurate in the relative sense that very few can hear it. But the Holy Spirit uses many, many different symbols and all kinds of sights and sounds you can read words that are inspired from the Holy Spirit. They may show up in a novel, on a bumper sticker, or on a billboard, just at the moment when you need to hear it most. You could have symbols, for example, songs that just come. You feel the inspiration, and you know just what to do after listening to a song on the radio that just happens to be playing when you get in the car. It could be little nudges from people, your brothers and sisters talking to you just when you are in that struggling moment, giving you the answers through them voicing the very thing you need to hear. The Holy Spirit has countless ways to reach the mind. It should not be discouraging that very few can directly hear the voice for God, the voice of the Holy Spirit. You must remember that the Spirit can reach you in many ways if you truly desire it and are open and willing to hear and proceed. Friend, when you started hearing this voice, what within you helped in such a way that you started hearing 
that voice in a clear way. David I would say that first of all it seems to contrast the human experience which is full of so many upsetting sorrowful and painful experiences You might say that within me there was a feeling that there must be an answer to this there must be an end there must be a better way there has to be a way out of this way of feeling there has to be a way out of this way of thinking and perceiving so the impetus was there the motivation for a change of tune a change of purpose was very very strong The other thing was that before I was hearing the Holy Spirit clearly I was intuiting the Holy Spirit I was feeling intuitions and impulses and promptings that felt very wonderful I would say that in the very beginning before I was hearing the Holy Spirit's voice I was feeling like someone had a feather in my heart chamber and was in there tickling my heart the very core of my being Initially I thought wow this is not an intellectual experience this is spectacular and I feel so good the tickle is guiding me Initially before it was listen to the holy spirit or follow the holy spirit it was follow the tickle and i did it got me into actually being able to hear the voice friend what do you tell people who ask you how do i quiet my mind how do i get rid of this mind chatter How can I get into that quiet place within? How do you teach people to do that? What do you say to them? David. There is an idea in the course that really helped me. It was that when you find resistance high and dedication weak, do not fight yourself. text chapter 30 section 1 this was a very helpful passage for me particularly at the beginning of my work with the course when i had extreme difficulty in quieting my mind for a sustained period i would experience a lot of irritation and frustration and then pray and open the book to a passage with a message like that like do not fight yourself i thought how wonderful a tool it is that is essentially saying put the book down rather than fighting yourself or trying to force your way through it i think it is a very deep theme and topic I tried initially in the parable of my life to go off and live in the woods in a very simple way with no running water and only bread and water to eat and drink The ego resistance to the silence was enormous and it seemed initially like there was not a whole lot of success at reaching a constant stillness So I learned to relax and to just tune in with the Holy Spirit and ask Okay what would you have me do here The guidance was not to just hang in with long hours of meditation I was guided to go places and meet people 
I started traveling and speaking with many different ACIM groups. And instead of going at the ego through meditation and trying to do battle with it, I just decided to follow my joy. Then the sense of resistance started going down little by little as I did follow my bliss and got used to letting the voice for God speak through me. Years later, I was guided to another hermitage experience where it was not a trying to be silent anymore. It was the silence of my natural self just pervading my experience. It was like the silence found me instead of me trying to find the silence. That was so freeing. That would be my main advice for people. As you are trying to still your mind, be very gentle with yourself. Do not try to speed it up or force it. If you do, which is ego, there will be a sense of coercion, like you are being forced to do something that you really do not want to do. Come back and follow the Holy Spirit's intuition and prompts. That will gently guide you in. Friend, I am curious as to what you think about the concept that in truth there is no Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is only one. I believe that the Trinity gives us a framework and understanding so that we, in our present experience, can come to a more full experience that we are one with all that is. Does that make sense? David Yes, that is exactly it. People have talked for a long time about the Trinity and have said that if there is only one and there is only perfect oneness, then what is the need for a Trinity? It is as you said. It is just a framework or structure to help the sleeping mind wake up. It is mainly in terms of functionality. God is the creator and Christ or Son is creation. And Holy Spirit is the bridge to help the sleeping son wake up to realize that I am Christ, an idea in the mind of God. I am That is what this is all about. Friend, what would you say is the biggest barrier to hearing God's voice and what is your advice for overcoming that barrier? David, a lot of people report that they sometimes feel like there is static or many voices. It is like trying to tune in to an FM station, but you are between stations. You hear a lot of static and maybe even feel panic about that because you feel you need an answer. People feel or say, oh my God, I need an answer, but this just makes the volume of the static go up. So I would say that the presence of fear is the biggest block to hearing the voice for the Holy Spirit. Because when the mind is in fear, it is afraid of hearing the Holy Spirit's voice. As ACIM says, 
No evidence will convince you of the truth of what you do not want. Text, Chapter 16, Section 2 I have always kept in mind that I had to begin to really cultivate my wanting to hear and wanting to experience the Holy Spirit's use of symbols. If I was really going to hear that voice consistently. So in short, fear is probably the biggest block to hearing the voice for God. And the answer to that is, of course, trust. Trust is the first of the ten characteristics of a teacher of God. He also says that when trust goes, all the rest goes. So you could imagine developing your characteristics and then letting, getting into fear and losing your trust. In Christian terms, they used to call this backsliding. With the course, sometimes people do swing from being passionate about it, practicing it every day and working with it, to closing the book and locking it in the closet, swearing that they do not want to see it. They may flush it down the toilet page by page or throw it in the river. Friend, how can people tell the difference between the Holy Spirit and the ego or the Holy Spirit and their own voice? It seems to be a question that is repeatedly asked and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. David that is probably one of the most often asked questions. I call it a question of discernment. Discernment between the voice of the ego and the voice of the Holy Spirit. It is a lesson in discernment. What was really helpful for me was when Jesus said, that the one right use of judgment is to see how you feel. Text chapter 4, section 4. That got my attention. When I read the first part of that statement, my ears perked up. The one right use of judgment. Wow! I am ready to let go of judgment and he is saying, the one right use? I would say the clearest, most straightforward, simple way is to really, really practice being in touch with how you feel. Of course, there are many subtleties to this because if you have a lot of distractions going on and your mind seems to be very scattered and not really pointed in attentiveness, then you may seem to have an upset, an irritation or an annoyance that goes unnoticed for quite some time and grows into anger and maybe even into rage before it gets your attention. But the more you get attentive to the mind and your thoughts through mind training, the more you are able to pay attention and notice that upset, which is a clear indication that you are in alignment with the ego and wrong-minded perception and thinking. In terms, of dis in terms of distinguishing the voice of the Holy Spirit from your own voice, in the ultimate sense, 
since the Holy Spirit speaks for the Christ, which is your own self. The voice of the Holy Spirit is always your voice because it always knows your best interests in every perceived situation you seem to be in. It knows your best interests with anything you may be dealing with. The Holy Spirit is your own voice because you are created by God. And the Holy Spirit speaks for God. In terms of sounding like a voice, it can sound many different ways. It can feel like a stream of consciousness, like a stream of thoughts, or it can have an audible quality to it. Many people who do not hear it consistently will say they have had moments when they were driving the car and they heard an audible voice saying, change lanes, and they paid attention and avoided what seemed to be an automobile accident. There are many ways that you can hear it. I would say that some people hear it as a sound that sounds like their own speaking voice. Others hear it as a masculine or feminine voice or as the voice of a young or elderly man or woman. But we must remember that these are all just forms and you are mainly paying attention to content, not the form that it comes in. That is probably the most straightforward way I could say it. Discernment is a very core topic. The way out of faulty perception is to tune into that voice and hear it clearly and consistently. That is the purpose behind everything that I do. The purpose behind our lives is really to come to that discernment. Friend, it seems like a lot of people worry that ego is going to somehow trick them into believing it is the Holy Spirit. Is that possible? David, the definition of the ego is the belief in separation. The ego is self-deception, and you might say that the ego's voice is trickery. All of the cosmos was made as a trick, where figures seem to come and go. And all of what seems to be linear time, objects and figures moving in and out of awareness, are part of a trick or sleight of hand, as Jesus calls it. It sounds almost like a poker game, but it is a trick. As you go through discernment exercises, it will seem like there are times when you follow the voice in your mind, and it seems to lead you down a dead-end road or to a state of upset. But actually, I think it is simpler to think of it as you just choosing your state of mind moment by moment. Every moment is a clean, fresh opportunity to choose again. That keeps it very simple and keeps it out of guilt. If you start looking at your life and your linear experiences and start analyzing them and saying, I must have been tricked here and there, you get into analyzing the past and trying to figure out the future. Those are always defenses against the present moment. Friend, 
There are lots of questions asked about how to maintain the awareness of God and have some peace amidst what seems to be chaos. Can you speak to this? David. Yes. A very often asked question is, how do I do this in the midst of work or chaotic situations? At the beginning, I think you do the best you can. It is important to start the day very firmly, open and connected, by doing your workbook lessons or by having quiet time and communing with the Holy Spirit and asking for instructions. It may be walks in the woods or by the ocean. The more you start to fine-tune this, the more you may be guided to longer stretches of what seems to be silence, even in terms of the world's definition. As you move along this path, there may even be times when you are guided to go for a hermitage experience or for a longer retreat. It will look like finding quiet spaces and quiet times. Even this is just a phase, because peace of mind is not circumstance dependent. So you may find yourself sailing across the ocean blue thinking, This is it. I have finally left the world behind. I just have to live on the ocean. That is not where this is leading, but those moments and periods of time can be very, very helpful and extremely nurturing as you go much deeper on the spiritual journey. Friend, now that you do not have the experience of having a split mind, do you ever find yourself talking to the Holy Spirit anymore? Do you find yourself looking for guidance or is that not necessary? Do you just know in the present moment that all is well and will unfold as it should? David, that is a very good question. Now, when I seem to call on the Holy Spirit in prayer, it is more like asking a rhetorical question. It is not a real question, but it is being used as a teaching device. For example, when I say a prayer and call upon the Holy Spirit's help in a group, it is really a symbol of being open to receive guidance. There is a sense of merging. I am identified with the voice. It is actually not so much like the early days where I was asking and receiving. It is more like a flow, almost like being carried in the river, where you are merged with the river. I am just enjoying the hum or the flow of all of life. In terms of asking for specifics, that was again a very helpful phase for me. When you get into that state of seeing that all things work together for good, then that asking starts to fade away. It gets used in terms of rhetorical kinds of questions that are teaching devices. In ACIM, for example, Jesus seems to ask many questions, even though the Christ mind is certain. Those questions are used as part of the teaching tool, as a model for a way of showing that it is helpful to ask questions and rely on the Spirit, until a state of certainty is achieved or experienced. 
So it does feel like that. When questions are asked, or guidance is sought as part of a group prayer, then that is just a symbol for me. There is not a two-ness there of asking a question and then waiting for this separate voice to give an answer. Friend, so when the ego falls away, there is a transition from seeking guidance to being it and watching the unfolding? David, exactly. I had a friend who visited many years ago. At first, she had great difficulty in hearing the Holy Spirit and being in touch with her intuitions. Then, with a lot of practice with the Course, using movies and many meditation practices, she would hear the voice speak to her and direct her on specific things like what movies to watch and what job to take and so forth. Then she went through a phase after that where she was panicking because she would ask for help and would hear nothing. She was panicking because she thought she had almost blown it and disconnected from the Holy Spirit. At one point I laughed and said, Silence is a wonderful gift. She looked at me in surprise. I can think of no greater gift than the stillness of God's presence. She was kind of assuming that the Holy Spirit should be chattering away all day to her if she were successful, and that when she was just having these quiet moments with no chattering going on, she was failing. A tranquil mind is no small gift. When you do have these moments, you do not have to get into a panic state. You need not expect that the Holy Spirit should be speaking and giving lectures and sermons. Just enjoy the stillness. That is where it all leads, to the silence and the experience where the voice for God is suddenly resting along with you, as you. Friend, can you clarify the difference between God and the Holy Spirit and why we cannot communicate directly with God? David, God is abstract love and light. You might say that the term communion would apply to God in the sense that it is being in an experience of total oneness with God. Jesus expressed this through the words, I and the Father are one. A communion experience where there seems to be a creator and a creation. There seems to be a father and a son, a source and an effect of that source. But actually, it is just one happy song of total creation. That is a description, even though it is beyond description, of God and heaven. In terms of communicating with God, the Holy Spirit is the bridge. In other words, God reveals God to us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit seems to take on the form of a voice for those that believe they have separated from God. The sleeping son of God. He has to reach the sleeping son of God in a way that can be understood. 
since this is a cosmos of time and space and specifics, then that abstract light has to take the form of a voice. In heaven, or abstraction, there are no voices. Everything is perfectly known, and you might say that there is a telepathic experience of perfect oneness and union. Abstraction seems to take the form of a voice for God, and that is how the Holy Spirit is described in ACIM. Not as the voice of God, which would imply that God has a voice. Abstraction does not even have a voice. But the voice for God is the voice that speaks and represents God to a mind that has fallen asleep and needs help and instruction to return back to that awareness of perfect oneness. Friend, how would you describe the Holy Spirit's response to the ego? David, I think the line, forgiveness merely looks and waits and judges not, Workbook, Part 2, is appropriate. There is a presence that is so peaceful and so tranquil and joyful. It is just certain in what is real and what is true. In one sense, you can say that the Holy Spirit and the ego really have no meeting point. It is like light and darkness. You cannot have a room that has both in it. If the light is on, the darkness is gone. If it is pitch dark, then there is an absence of light. These are two thought systems that have no meeting point whatsoever. You might say that metaphorically speaking, the Holy Spirit overlooks error. That still implies that error is there. But the Holy Spirit is good at overlooking it. In the Song of Prayer, Jesus tells us to not see error. The first time I read that, I was like, Oh my God, do not see error? What a state of mind is that, where it is impossible to see error? You become so riveted in the truth that the error disappears entirely. The truth is true, text chapter 14, section 2, and only the truth is true. Workbook lesson 66. That is what this is all aimed at. You get into such bliss and happiness and joy that there is not a sense of first discerning or experiencing the error and then releasing it and coming into the light. You literally experience that the truth is all-encompassing. You need to put the purpose out front. It is only the ego that looks back and then tries to judge the situation. But when you hold the goal out front, you will see everything that you perceive as witness to the purpose that you hold. Put the peace out front. This was extremely helpful for me. In fact, when I was working with the Course in the early days, I would say the prayer. I am here only to be truly helpful. 
Text chapter 2, section 5. I would recite that whole prayer silently in my mind every time I would walk through a doorway where I was going to the grocery store or to a course in miracles meeting or to the laundromat or wherever. It would really help me set the goal so that as I went into that grocery store I was in a state of humbleness willing to be truly shown how to be truly helpful to not prejudge the experience or have an agenda. For example, it was not to have preconceptions about how fast to get in and out, to look for the best prices or to try and read through all the ingredients on the packages in order to get the most nutritious ones. It was to actually go in there with the goal to have only holy encounters with everything and everyone set in front. And when I actually started to practice that, I had so many miraculous and joyful experiences that I said, Wow! This is very important and extremely practical. Just that shift of practicing brought me wonderful miracles that helped me gain confidence in practicing ACIM. Friend, what would your experience be if you saw something standing in front of you, maybe yelling at the person next to them? David, the words that come to mind are unified perception, which is all things working together for good. When you have a single purpose, then all the images are unified and all the sights and sounds are unified. Smells and other perceptions that seem to be physical are all part of this unified experience. I experience the whole situation like a tapestry where I am simply flowing with spirit and knowing that all things are working together for good. In one sense, that is what unified perception gives you. It takes away all the judgments and the preconceptions that would break the situation apart into separate behaviors and separate symbols. It just gives you a unified experience. Even though here the Holy Spirit can speak about these things as if there were separate reactions and experiences. That is what the joy of enlightenment is. It is no problem. There is just happiness. Friend, do persons awaken? I do not think there are that many people in this moment that are actually awake. I think there are millions of people that are in the process, working it, practicing it, going through it, and yet I have not seen many people pop out the other side. Yet, to have even a couple of people in my life where I can see that has occurred is really a blessing. So thank you. It is really incredible. David, as we are going through the process, we are grateful for all the signs and symbols, the Buddhas and Krishnas, Jesus and the mystics, and the saints that seem to be sprinkled throughout history. We are so grateful for them. And the more you apply the teachings of the Course, the more you realize that it is just one mind waking up and recognizing itself. 
as Jesus says, When I awoke, you were with me. He says it another way in the Manual for Teachers. How many teachers of God are needed to save the world? The answer to this question is one. Manual for Teachers, Chapter 12. One! That answer is amazing! There is one mind, and there is only one of us, and we are all the Christ. When people talk about awakened beings and say that Jesus was awakened, I remind them that Jesus the man was an illusion. That is quite a striking statement for many. I would say that persons do not really awake. It is just that the mind that was dreaming it was a person realizes that it was mistaken. It is quantum physics. There is a big turnaround here. Friend, in the world it looks like the 100th monkey syndrome. <laughs> but it is really the one monkey syndrome. David, that is right. The one monkey sees that it is not a monkey. Friend, you said earlier that the Holy Spirit is our own voice and the more we listen to it and spend time with that voice and experience it, the more we really do start to identify it as ourselves. That is the greatest news ever. David, yes, but do not step ahead of yourself. He says in the development of trust section of the Manual for Teachers that the teacher of God has not yet come as far as he thinks. You hear, not my will, but thine be done. When you are starting out, that seems to be a great technique in the mind for surrendering to something that is greater than yourself. Then you read the Course and Jesus says that your will and God's will are the same. You are one. All of a sudden, the old quote starts to seem funny. You think, oh yeah, God's will is my will, and the voice for God is my true voice? But at the early stages of mind training, these seem like arrogant statements. They do not seem appropriate at all. Once you get into advanced mind training and you are feeling the peace of God. Statements like, I and the Father are one, and my will and God's will are one, seem very, very natural. <laughs>